Welcome home. We are WNST AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, Baltimore strong, Baltimore proud, and Baltimore positive. Um, I've been in Florida the last six days away for the NFL owners meetings where Steve Bishotti and Eric DaCosta ran from me in the middle of the night. Um, and in the middle of the night, we had uh, a tragedy here that um, it's going to take a long, long time to unpeel. This is my first segment back. If you're hearing it on the radio, um, we're back. Opening day's Thursday, we hope, maybe Friday, based on the rain. Uh, we'll figure all that out. But uh, the one thing we know, and I knew landing at BWI on Tuesday night after uh, spending a week in Florida with the Orioles and with the NFL owners meetings is that the key bridge is gone. And uh, I was awakened at 5.50 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Um, got in, literally. Uh, Bashadi and Chad Steele were running from me at, at 12.30 in the morning, and I got home at 1 and uh, woke up at almost 6 and saw the tragedy, put the TV on. I'm in Florida. I'm in a hotel room. I'm literally at Disney World, for crying out Like Kids are screaming in the other rooms. Um, and everywhere I went on Tuesday uh, – through Orlando in the airport and obviously a plane bound for Baltimore. Um, it's the biggest story in the world for a day. Uh, it'll be our story. It'll be the biggest story here for the next couple of years. Bill Cole joins us now. Uh, he is Cole Roofing and Gordian Energy. You know, I, I guess it's sort of um, apropos that you're my first guest in the aftermath of this because this is the first time I'm going to talk about the bridge other than putting pictures up and um, – how are you doing, man? Well, welcome. I'm wearing my Costa shirt because I want to give love to my friends over in the peninsula. Anybody over in the Sparrows Point area, Edgemere, Fort Howard, where I'm from, man, Dundalk, um, that access and business and commerce is going to change. So I want to give them some love while I give you some love with my Royal Farms coffee in the uh, cold roofing mug. What's going on, brother? How are you? Good morning. Uh, or Yeah, so. Depends on when they're listening. <laughs> right. Uh. Uh, you know, I'm like, I just want to have lots to say, which is usually a struggle for you and I to share the mic, but we'll, we'll figure our way through it. I, I want to be respectful, right? Like we're still really raw to the, you know, incident and the accident. So, you know, there was loss of life. It is, you know, terrible. And there's families and we pray and, you know, I, I personally am just not real good at all that. Like my brain just immediately starts like gyrating on the problem and the solution. How do we rebuild it? Right. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I'm just not, an, I'm not well, good you at show up, uh, tell everybody what you do for a living. You show up <laughs> after wind takes the roof off my mother's house or a business, right. Uh, right. primarily businesses because my, my mother's house, you came and rescued me, but I saw the carnage and the damage and my mother and the roofs off and like, holy hell. And yeah. you're like, she's crying. Is she okay? Is the dog okay? Is everything okay? Let's fix the roof. Right. So right. like, I, I know that that's the way your mind works. And so give me your day. Get, get, like how, how does one find out about this? Jessica Vallis, who is runs our website. She's rebuilding the new Baltimore positive. We're relaunching that next week. I'm in the middle of this crazy documentary with, with Greg Landry over at blue rock productions and Towson. So I have all this stuff going on I, I don't know that you're ever prepared for a text where the text was sent to me at 3 30 in the morning now i had my phone oh. off right so oh. i didn't hear it so i didn't find it till then and they, i immediately grabbed the remote which i never do in, in a hotel room and went oh. to cable television and the first thing i saw was johnny o literally johnny o popped oh. up on my screen i might as well have been in towson um and the police chief from baltimore city was just so impressive. I mean, all, Brandon, Wes, just a everybody that got down there at four o'clock in the morning and, and then the thousands of people that are doing this. I I, I stand in awe. I really do. And I I, uh, I mean, we're I'm 24 hours into this and it's very, very raw to me. I mean, I found myself sobbing three or four times and I can't stop and I see pictures and I don't even know why. Like, it reminds me of the Tony Sopranos thing with the ducks. Like, I don't know why I'm emotional but like that thing was in the sky i could see that from my bathroom in my childhood home i could look out the window and see it i could see it from my home on kane street and i i could not see it from my home downtown for 19 years it was the only view i didn't have i <laughs> i had i had 280 degrees of the 360 view right, and right. the only view i didn't have was fed hill 
and fully down the bay to see the key bridge. The only thing we couldn't see from my home. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I it, I didn't see it, see it until like if you're heading north on 95 past the 395 interchange to go downtown, you you can look over Baltimore Peninsula. Because you're high enough it. up. When, yeah, when you're you in Dundalk, like literally, yeah. when, right. Yeah. When you're over my childhood home at Eastern Avenue on 95, yeah. Kane Street, and you look out, you can see it from everywhere. Yeah, yeah. it's the key bridge, man. I mean, like. But that being said, I remember the day it opened, uh, and I had to tell my wife this. Like, I got, I got a little busted up telling it. So I hope I can tell you. But my uncle Norman came over to my house. I was nine years old. It was 1977. I remember my uncle Norman come, came over to the house. He said the new bridge is open. I want to drive you over it. And he put me in the car, and we went down past Costas, up onto the bridge, and took the bridge over and turned around at Fort Smallwood Road and came back. And I remember the first ride over and seeing the city. I remember the second ride over and saying, what's that little island down there? What's that thing? Um, so I remember the first time I went over the bridge, and I don't remember a life before it. I don't remember it not being there. Uh, yeah, I get, you know, I don't, I don't remember ever looking out and not seeing it there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I find it fascinating to kind of listen to the national news, right? Because you always get a different perspective of what the outside universe is thinking about us. Um, you know, like you living here, the key bridge, based on my traffic patterns and like what I do, the key bridge is like a nice bailout, you know, like when 95 is a mess or the west side of the beltway is a mess or whatever you can always you know especially if you're not you don't mind adding like 10 minutes to your drive maybe save you, 20 yeah you know there's nobody <laughs> over there so you just drive over on that side um but to listen to everyone else you know i mean if you just look at the map you're like this is a major northeast corridor artery and i think for trucking it probably is especially with the hazmat issues of the tunnels and so it, it it is, you know. I think of our friends down at Trade Point, like oh man, that's why I'm wearing my Costa shirt. I'm that's like, like fundamental problem. I I know. don't know how many people come to Costas across the bridge, but I do know that Trade Point Atlanta and Jobs and more than that, anything that's I'm from that area. It's my home. You know what I mean? Like so, it, watching this on TV was just. I don't know. How I'm going to make it all day talking about this, Bill. You know, I really don't. Um. So, I like. Well, I want to keep talking about the actual incident, and then I want to try and I'll give you my optimistic spin. But, uh, like, there's some level, and you know, one day maybe we'll all understand. But like, there's some level of training and preparedness that i don't know if you've heard like the call they have like t tape of it now where mayday goes from the boat in the bridge police are notified they shut down the road like reality even at 1 30 in the morning if that system hadn't been drilled and trained and we didn't have a process for that you know you'd have lost a dozen more cars a dozen more people two dozen more people i mean it would have been significantly worse. So they stopped traffic. Like now. Some Within have... seconds, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I watched I mean, that video. Within yeah. cars were flying, trucks, you could see yeah. the lights, and then it stops, and then the, then the bridge fell. Like right. it. Yeah. Uh, there's some, you know, there's definitely some work to do to understand how the construction crew, <clears throat> you know, was still out there that that that's a miss and uh you know we're gonna learn more about that along the way uh there was a time <laughs> well i i've heard a lot of that i mean think about it that's pretty close to us and what Dude, we, we saw and, video and, of the real incident in real time that whole thing happened in 90 seconds right i mean literally it was 90 seconds lights again, go out hate, lights go on right. steam comes out I hate Mayday, those... and then the Brit. Like it, it, it did not. It happens fast, man. It happened I know, fast. I, I know. I'm, I'm not a. I like hate to speculate on your platform. Like if it's just us to talking, I don't mind. But you know, all the people that are listening, I, I, I just know that when 
three or four guys, or in this case, six guys or whatever it was, are kind of doing some work. Like somebody sees the boat, like they, they know the boats there. They see what's happening to the boat. Like, I, I don't know. They said there were maybe they were on lunch break. I, again, like I said, there's a story there and we're going to have to unpack it. Um, there's a story around the boat, you know, the boat's failure. I my understanding is that that boat would have been piloted by a Baltimore Harbor pilot, not the ship's captain. Someone needs to verify that for me. Uh, we have really good friends that we've done work for over the years that run a lot of the tugboats down there. Uh, you know, the tugboats pull away once they drop the ship into the channel. So, uh, you know, there's. When you get roofing supplies, like big time, you're doing a job on the stadium. I'm making that up at a college or a convention. The kind of work coal roofing does. Those materials, the stuff that comes in, that does that come in on a truck or does that come in on a boat? Like, does that come? Uh, how does your stuff get here? You, you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. this is opening oh. my mind because I, I never knew how important the port was until probably 15 years ago. You're a kid. You're from East Baltimore. It's just there. You drive by it every day. You, the salt piles by the tunnels and like all of that. The Baltimore positive thing and me getting to be a grown up and being 55 now and sort of understanding all the cars that come in that I used to see when I went through the Harbor Tunnel as a boy that were stacked up over on the Brooklyn side. And and also the, the, the first thing I, I would say, and this, you know, this is where I'll come up with the terrorism line and like all that stuff that we could talk about in regard to foul play is that. I always believe the tunnels were targets, right? The tunnels were always targets when there was a, when it went from orange to red, from, you know, whatever those alerts are, where you go to the airport and, you know, there's a, a terrorism threat and like levels high. When the level's high, the tunnels would be completely a target, right? Because if you could shut down the port, you could sort of disrupt commerce in America or the East Coast or, you know, screw things up if you're, the, you're a bad guy, right? So I've always known that. So when the bridge went down, obviously the foul play stuff and the, the right wing zealots and like all of that, people going crazy. But it's not far fetched to think if you wanted to handicap our city that not our city, but our country, that these are the kinds of crazy things that happen. So all of that conspiracy craziness. But now the port really is shut down. And we're going to assume ninety nine point nine percent here that this was completely accidental. And we're going to find out all the things you're talking about. But this is a logistical issue that i don't understand that i'm trying to un i mean i know the bridge is gone i'm emotional about it right. people can't get the car i got all of that right. now i'm on day two and i'm like well, what does this mean for all of it in regard yeah. to people like you not even being able to get your stuff and you're just one of a billion businesses that things yeah. come into that board that i'm not even aware of what they are but i would think this is i heard amazon packaging and this and that whatever and i'm thinking all right so the thing i ordered on amazon's not coming but i'm thinking about crippled businesses or industries um and how quickly things can get rerouted through norfolk or this or that or wherever things come in from right yeah i, mean, I think there's you know, there's the immediate problem of the dozen or so boats that are sitting out in the bay waiting to come in that can't come in. And then there's the dozen or so boats that are in that can't get out. Uh, you know, a lot of our stuff is manufactured in the U.S. or coming over the road. But the raw, a lot of the raw materials come from abroad. So so there is a port, there is shipping, I you know. I don't know. I'm not close enough to really fully understand. I think that the so it comes the, to your office, you're not sure exactly what port it comes. Like uh, literally, right. why would you think about this stuff? Uh, you don't I mean, go down there and pick it up on the on the on the <laughs> at the learned, at the dock and bring it back, right? Right. We learned a lot. <laughs> we learned a lot through COVID because of the supply chain problems that occurred. You know, so I would say that we're probably better suited today to handle this sort of disruption than we were pre-COVID because we just learned how to be flexible uh, during that period. You know, do you remember there was probably a couple months span where the top of the story was like all the problems at the ports and not being able to get the boats in or get them unloaded. And then the, the containers, there weren't any empty containers and because nobody was unpacking the container. So shipping became a disaster. Well, during that time period, we built smaller boats that could go to, you know, shallower ports 
uh, we so we we built a lot of redundancy and flexibility in the shipping system. So I I'm assuming here's what I love about it. Everyone in the world yesterday was reminded about Baltimore Port and how fundamentally important it is and how awesome it is. You know, we're we're the deepest port on the eastern seaboard, meaning that we come farther west than anybody. So if you're pushing goods via truck into the middle of the country, you need to come to Baltimore because it saves you, you know, four hours, eight hours, 12 hours by trucking. Than out of New, New England yeah. or out of right. the, the, the South. Okay, yeah. right. So, I mean, look, again, I opened with you about my lack of uh, emotional <laughs> IQ, right? Like I... Like it, I have a hard time talking about the loss of life and the sadness. I go right to, like, how do we solve this and what's the what's the long term outcome? That's just I'd rather dwell on that. Maybe maybe I'm just avoiding the hard parts. I don't know, but like, uh, there is a history that says when cities have catastrophic incidences, they come out significantly better so when detroit files for bankruptcy it's like the beginning of the new turning of the corner and the revival new orleans is a, is in a hard place katrina happens katrina the incident is horrible but the the underlying theme is when the federal government comes to your city and sprinkles billions of dollars on it like good stuff happens. It's like economic stimulus. Like you. I I don't want to say that this is going to help Trade Point Atlantic in the end, ten years from now. But the whole world knows where it is now. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And everyone is looking at it because remember now, with the exception of maybe a maintenance guy who didn't fix the boat right, like the story's going to be. That the mechanical failure in the boat and the the pilot did everything he could. Like you see the big smoke that comes out of the boat when a power comes back in. That's him yelling, full reverse rudder or whatever they say in the movies. You know, like he knew he's dropping anchors. Like he's doing everything he can. Well, apparently the dropping of the anchor turned the boat. Uh, Like from from what I've seen on and I don't. Again, I'm not a boat expert, and I don't want to play one. And to your point, how it happened, there'll be smarter people, you know, to to put that. But but what do we do as citizens? What do we do as leaders? What do we do as business owners? What do we do as residents? What do we do as, you know, just concerned citizens? I, you know, some people will start to go down the insurance hole, or now that Biden said he's paying for it, nobody even cares about insurance. And then it was like, well, no, somebody cares about insurance here. You trust me on that. But the weird story, and again, you asked me about my day yesterday. Well, you know, any free minute I was reading or looking at something, but like my day went on as normal, right? I mean, we got to do what we got to do. So, but Maersk or whatever they are, you know, giant shipping company, it talked about how they leased that boat to another company. That company didn't have any employees on the boat, so there's some other operators involved. And da 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 da. You're gonna find a very tangled web, corporate veiled, protective scenario. Nobody right? wants to take responsibility for knocking down a key bridge. Right. I mean, the, <laughs> the number the number staggering because it's the cost of the bridge, the cost of the cleanup, the cost of the loss of life. The cost of the port shut down, the cost, co- you know, like the at the cost of tolls that don't get like there's just you just keep piling on and piling on and piling. I mean, it's a massive I, I it's a massive claim. But I wonder how many people today that this is what I was asking you was a business. How many people like Bill Cole, Cole Roofing own a business Acme shipping app, Acme automobile, whatever it is. Right. Doesn't matter. How many of those people are going to wind up being in disarray over the next 60 or 90 days in regard to can't get that, couldn't get that, can't get that? I I, I don't know, but that was the thing that came to me, which is, all right, there's the um, immediate emotional all loss of life and all that. What does it mean? You know, what does this tactically mean? And how long does it take to build a bridge? Apparently, in 1972, it took five years to build that bridge. I, I You know, how long does it take to clear 
debris. How long did I, like I? I yeah, I don't want to. I, I don't want to jump. I don't want to jump to that. I want to let, let's finish this interruption of, to life. Like there's there's a whole bunch of people who are figuring out the rerouting of their deliveries or their their trucking, and it's going to add cost, right? Like it's going to add cost to stuff. Like if I have to do a job in Dundalk now, like it's going to take me longer to get there. Dundalk used to be pretty easy for Marbutus, right? I go around the west side, you know, the south side of the Beltway to the east side, go across the Key Bridge, boom, I'm in Dundalk. Not now a you got to go past my kid's house in Dundalk. <laughs> yeah, well, now I'm probably going to go north, get off at Boston, jump over to Dundalk Avenue, you know, like, yeah, okay. Kind of like how I used to do it in the old days when I was in Hamilton and I needed to get over there. It was more like navigating through the streets to get over there. Cause That's the beauty of Dundalk, baby. That's the dirty D. Right. So... <sighs> I think there's a there's a fair amount of like cost impact and and life impact and you know kind of nice that we're going to ease into this because it's spring break for the kids so the traffic is already kind of like less but yeah all those people who what do you think of Ray Bachman in Pasadena who would always say to me I'll meet you at Costas anytime that's easy let's go across the bridge it's right there and now I say hey Ray you want to meet me at Costas. Well, you know, I mean, I got to go into Highland Town and then turn, you know, and then make a, a, a right, and then I got to drive through German Hill Run, places I don't know, and I got to go past Drug City and stop in. And, and, um, have lots of friends, lots of friends in Sparrows Point, Dundalk, and uh, I want to make sure these people still come to Costas. I want to make sure I give Ray Bachman yeah. it, like, hey, dude, you're coming to Costas. Go through the tunnel, get your ass over here, and figure it out. That's, dude, that's got to be my message to everyone, right, from my hometown. Yeah, I. It's an interesting, so let so let's that's good transition to like the future, right? So, I think if the federal government determines that the, I think somebody said it was like, nah, I, uh, that's I don't know if I've seen a number of like economic loss by the port being closed, right? So, like, what does it cost every day for our port to be closed? Well, that that makes a really good case. You can do, like, the math on how much you spend. Like, the, the cleaning up, I know everybody just thinks it's like cleaning up. And when you look at the picture, you think that there's, there's steel beams that are sitting on the end of that boat. It just kind of looks like little, like a little canopy or something that cracked. But, like, that was a giant road with a bridge with giant steel like this cleanup is no joke so but, it took five years to build it how long is it going to take to dredge right. it out of the harbor i mean it's not going to happen this weekend and and i'm sure you know they'll get the army corps engineers involved and you know really smart people will come swooping in and you know you gotta get you just need to clear this much right so you can start traffic you know maybe you can't have in and out at the same time right but there's a process um, but that is a matter of manpower and equipment, right? Like how many boats have cranes mounted on them that are ha strong enough to like put a guy, climb up on there, burn the steel, pull the steel off with a crane, set it on a barge, move on. You know what I mean? Like that's the process you're doing, you know? I don't even know enough to understand the, the underwater part. I'm just thinking about the 60 part days of that is what you're thinking. 60 days. Oh, of that, so that's, that's what my wife and I were talking about. Like the shortest possible time is every possible piece of equipment that is in existence and 24 hours a day with as many men who are qualified and men, women, whatever, that are qualified to do that work. I don't. Let's just say you had an unlimited budget and there was an unlimited number of pieces of equipment and an unlimited number of manpower. I don't know that you do it in 60 days. I don't even think that's possible. It's just too hard. It's too much work. Getting just clear, clearing the riverway, you're saying. Just clearing yeah, the debris. Again, you know how many rivers I've cleared of bridges? None. So Zero, like, take right. take this for what it's worth. But I just think about how hard it is to do stuff in the world. And that's without even people trying to like have oversight and regulatory compliance and all the other sort of concerns 
I mean, we can't allow this to destroy the ecology of the bay, right? Like we spend millions of dollars trying to bring the crab population and the oyster population back. And then, you know, we can't just come in here and because the bridge fell, just destroy the ecology of the bay. So we, we have to be mindful of that too. So I think it's- Man, you're smart. I hadn't even thought about it. I mean, I did when, when we were talking about gasoline because, you know, smell like, like the first thing I thought is, oh my God, now they're going to pollute my- Right. They're going to pollute Dundalk and the harbor and mm-hmm. like, oh, my God, you know, like because right. I thought that that boat would have a lot of a lot of oil in it. You know, you I mean, a lot of petroleum in it yeah. as it's leaving port. Right. L- literally thousands right. of gallons of gas in that. And I that think thing. it's OK. I don't think I don't think I haven't heard anything about that. I think well, that's but that okay. was it was an original. Yeah, yeah, I like, got you. Sure. That's where the sure, ecology sure. and the bay sure. and. Sure. You know, the herons on the on the license plates and, you know, all of that came into play for me and thinking about that. Bill Cole uh, from Cole Roofing and Gordian Energy is our guest. I've got some Royal Farms powering this thing up here. I'm wearing my Costas shirt, eating one of my wife's chocolate chip cookies that she made for me while I was in Florida, thinking I was going to Epcot and Disney World. Instead, I was on a veranda where Steve Bishotti and Eric DaCosta are running from me like cowards. And then four hours later, the bridge falls and then I'm flying home and... By the way, Bill, it's opening day this week. Um, you know, I was down doing football and baseball. Man, that stuff seems – it's like when my wife got cancer 10 years ago. It's just like doesn't mean anything when we have a bridge that falls. And opening day and the Star Spangled Banner and the new owner and David Rubenstein had a, a powwow with, you know, high-powered folks like you on Tuesday night uh, down at the Engineers Club in Baltimore talking about things. I mean – it. it this is a memorable week for our city, huh? I mean, like, well, yeah, this I, is a, I, this is a, you never know when your 9-11 is going to happen for your town. Oh, no, that, no, 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 I'm going to stop that, you. No, 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 no. We, we, as humans, like, only know two kinds of crisis, or like, one kind of crisis, I guess, and that's this, like, super horrible crisis. And we automatically put this into that bucket. And again, no, no, I, dude, I, you're being unemotional about it because you look to the sky and it's gone. That's what I say. That's what I mean about 9 11. You, you, there is a symbol for right. until it's rebuilt right. that this tragedy happened. And for anybody that's going to cost this, they know the bridge isn't there. We're going to be thinking about that bridge more than we ever thought about it. And I'll be honest, I didn't use it that much. You know what right. I mean? Like, right. I, right. I did not use it right. that right. much. I am not right. the guy that went over it 10 times a week, like my son did, who worked in Anne Arundel County and lived in Dundalk, right? right. So, Right. I went over that bridge, I don't know, four times a year, six times a yeah. year, maybe, right. because I just never – I used right. the tunnels. I'm a tunnel guy. I lived on right. Kane Street. I I mean, I right. dated a girl from Pikesville that had never been through the tunnel in her life. She was 30 <laughs> right. years old because right. why would you go through the tunnel if you live in Pikesville? You, right. you take the north side or the south side? So I can't imagine that people from Pikesville went over the bridge much or people from Westminster went over the bridge much or people from anywhere north and west would use that bridge. To your point, it was always, there was never anybody on the road. There never is anybody on the road. I drive past a Walmart where I grew up. There's, it, it is a wide road, and I always say this to my wife, the road was built because of Sparrow's Point. The, right. the road was built right. in 1973 or conceived in the late 60s because the, the steel. Bridge. Same with the bridge. Right. Same with the bridge. Correct. Well, the bridge was built for hazmats. As my understanding, and let's do a little Baltimore history here. That bridge doesn't get built if Sparrow's Point isn't on the other side of that. You know what I'm saying? I agree with that. I agree with that 100%. But I also would would say this, knowing a life without the bridge, knowing a life without the McHenry Tunnel, right? So bridge came in 77, tunnel came in 81, 82, whenever that was. You can look it up. I remember the first time I went through that with Pete Elliott to go to a Skipjacks game. How about that? We went to a Skipjacks game. We went through the tunnel the first time. Um, hey, let's take a tunnel over there. That'll cost a dollar. I think it was only 50 cents at the time to go through the tunnel. But why are you paying 50 cents to go through the tunnel? We can just drive down Eastern Avenue past the park. Take take the bus. Um, I don't have to pretend my Dundalk accent. I have a real one. Um, but I would say that part of all of that is this – largest that was Sparrow's Point. And the reason that all of this stuff got built was Baltimore was a freaking nightmare for everyone. For anyone going from New York, Philadelphia, Boston to D.C. or Florida, 
Baltimore was, oh, my God, I got to drive through the tunnel. When I get to Baltimore, we're, we're going to have an hour and a half. Like this, I'm talking 1968, right? Ni- 1972, the, 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 the family roadster, you're taking the family to Walt Disney World. You know, which wasn't built till 76. But if you're going to Florida, if you're in the corridor, Baltimore was a nightmare. And the Harbor Tunnel with two lanes in two directions for that kind of traffic, for trucking and for non-hazmat, you had to go around the Beltway. I'm talking 1971, 72. So we were a nightmare transportation city in that way because of the because of the Harbor Tunnel, the original tunnel and everyone using it, that the second tunnel got built and the bridge got built. I, I can't fathom a life with with one harbor tunnel. Think about that, Bill. And the city was vibrant. The city had a million people at the time, right? Uh, there were a lot. There was a lot more people in right. in this congested area than White Marsh and Bel Air. None of that existed 50 years ago. But it, it, it's an amazing part of the transportation history of our city as to how all of this stuff got built and why it got built. It got built because we were a nightmare city from a transportation standpoint because stuff got built wrong. Ask Barbara Mikulski. They were trying to they say. were trying That's, to run 95 right. through Canton. Right. Literally, That's what I was just right? going to say. I, I, we've heard stories and I've learned stuff from you and your guests along the way about the other challenges that have occurred uh, in the road to nowhere and, and trying to build 95. And yeah, so it, like, all right, great segue. Here's my question. Get the debris cleared. Get the port back open. Is it take a year? Does it take two years? to do a study to actually decide whether we should put that bridge back there, whether it should be a tunnel, whether we should build it taller, whether we should move it. Well, they're not going to build a tunnel because people aren't going to allow that. They're going to want to see a bridge. I'm telling you, it'd be like saying, let's build, let's rebuild the trade centers, but let's make it a subway. No, 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 no. We're America. We're going to erect it. We like to erect things. Like I'm telling you, there, there's no way Johnny O, who lived down there and could look at it, is going to be involved in. We're not going to build something that looks that looks like powerful. We're not now. Listen, I think a tunnel might be is, a better idea. I don't this know. Is the, I mean, this but, is the problem with. Well, no, we we have to do it that way because that's how we've always done it. Mm-hmm. You and I have just spent 20 minutes talking about the fact that you drove over it four times a year. It's always empty. It's not a heavily trafficked road. Now, it but for serves, hazmats, it's, it's I incredibly important, right? I understand it serves a purpose. Don't get me wrong. I'm not okay. saying that there isn't a problem to solve. There is Man, clearly 20 minutes into this, and we're building the tunnel already, Cole. What's wrong with you? I don't know if we're building a tunnel. But yeah, but, but listen, just, some guy smarter, some guy smarter could come on the it. show six months yeah. from now and sell yeah. me on a tunnel and say, instead of building the bridge, let's build like Let's take that money we put into a bridge and build something useful and spare, you know, like next to trade well, point that brings people or whatever. I right, don't know. Well, well I'm my... open minded. I, I, I'm just saying the popular opinion, you know, for the people in Dundalk, you know, build no tunnel. We got to have bridge back. And, you know, I mean, I'm telling you, that's what's going to happen because I feel that way. I want to see a structure. I'm an American. Erect it. Don't my, build me a subway, you know? My ask is the city and the county, the metro area, is about to get billions of federal pixie dust sprinkled on them, right? You have to do 30, 50-year planning to use that in the best way. Like, our port was restricted because of bridge heights. You know, you have Bay Bridge Heights and you have Key Bridge Heights. So there are ships that can't come in. There are types of boats that can't come in. The newest cruise boats can't come in. Like, so my opinion, so like once you get away from all the sadness and the challenges, it's like, this is it. This is it. This is the, this is the pivot day. Like the model of Baltimore is going to change because of everything you ever didn't like about the key bridge. You can now, you can now, Say, hey, we're 50 years further on. We can, we can, we can rethink this. That's a beautiful sentiment. I mean, I like that's something well, I hadn't it, thought about. And it has this ripple effect of, well, wait a second. If I can get bigger boats in there, that means I got to revamp the port. So there's another couple billion that goes into revamping the port. And wait a second. If you can take those boats 
and you have port facilities for that size boats, you know what we should build right next to that? The crap that goes on those boats. So we never wanted to put our manufacturing plant in Baltimore because we couldn't put our product on a boat big enough to, to economically get it out to sea. But so let's move our business to Maryland. Oh my yes. gosh! Whoa! Wait a second. Like that's to me. I you know with those trips I go on and all this other stuff. Like there there are these things that happen that we that, have that other cities have no. Well, possibility yeah, yeah, but before that, right but before that cincinnati could never right. add this to their portfolio right? right literally right but before that there's this catastrophe right like everyone in baltimore is doing a good job we're trying hard we're we're winning despite ourselves we have a public safety problem we have this problem we have that problem we have all this stuff and you know People have said maybe we should just file bankruptcy. Let's let's clean the slate. You know, let's start with a clean slate. All these things. But this is this is our incident. This is our catastrophe. Like, thankfully, you know, it wasn't. I called it our 9-11 a minute ago and you got mad at me. So please well, don't. Because it's, it's not. It wasn't. The loss of human life is still like I, I, is. I'm just saying from a visual standpoint for me crying about it five times on Tuesday and not even understanding why. And I'm not even in Maryland and I'm about to cry about it again, talking to you about it, that that is, that's the emotional attachment to this structure that 830 in the morning, I'm in a hotel room sobbing and I have no idea why I, 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 I you, you know, like I, I think there's a thing here that once this, the emotions die down, this conversation we're having right now, is going to be, um, you know, a big part of Baltimore positive. I don't think there's a whole lot of people over the next year, year and a half, I'm not going to talk right. to who aren't going to have some more educated opinion about it than they have today or yesterday. And um, and I know everybody was a boat expert and, a, you, you know, like all that on Tuesday. Right. But I, right. I think once that settles down, this notion of we have a, 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 a blank slate. Right. I mean, that's the way I feel about David Rubenstein with the Orioles. Like, hey, man, you come in, you can you can he keeps saying fresh start, start again, start again, start again. This is tragic. It's awful. It's but to your point. All right. What were the challenges with the bridge that we would have changed if we could have altered it? Now, let's get the smartest people we can and make this is let's make this better for the next 50 years. Right. I mean, that 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 should be we're, there'll be a pivot point on that. Not today, but there'll be a pivot point on that in the next 30 days, I bet. In, I don't know if it's 30 days. We could hope, but the bureaucracy, like like to your point about the uh, the good job that they did handling the press conferences, as the day went on, the number of people at the press conferences kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And every politician in town was standing in front of their microphones by the time the end of the day came. But... So there's a lot of people who are going to have opinions, right? That to your point, the people in Dundalk are going to want to see a bridge. There're going to be a lot of people with opinions with no expertise, right. like like me, not you, because you know a little bit more than me. And but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, I just think one example, uh, and the people might really hate this, but like, you know, they're still trying to put this the bag love train in, you know, to get right. from D.C. to New York. Well. I mean, getting through and around Baltimore is a problem for the Magla. Like, it you got to put it somewhere, right? It's got to go somewhere. I don't know. We're about to build something to cross that span of the river. Maybe the Maglev should be part of the project. Maybe it's a road train, you know, combo deal. Again, your your great rich aunt elda showed up at your door and handed you a briefcase full of billions of dollars to fix your property yeah like like and and it's it's what they should do right it's number one it's an interstate number two it's it's about you know national commerce so the government i'm not disparaging the fact that the federal government should pay for it i'm just saying that when this has happened in other places if you use this and you put thought into it, it becomes the backbone of your your 20-year plan. 
right? Like, forget everything else we had thought of to be for today. Yeah, I, I because, don't want to be crass, but it's an opportunity, right? In the yeah, end, it'll, be, it, it'll become 100%, an opportunity. Right? 100%. And look, again, I know I'm I'm not nice, and the, and the loss of life is sad, and I feel for those guys, and I know the company, and we know, you know, like, that is horrible. But our Key Bridge police also saved a dozen, two dozen, three dozen lives. You know, like... They drilled. They knew what to do. The call came in. They told them, stop the traffic. I'm already here. Done. Stop. You know, like, you can watch the video and see how many, at 1.30 in the morning, cars were going back and forth across that bridge. And then it stopped, and within 20 seconds, the bridge was gone. Yes. Right. So I... It's almost miraculous, really, it, right? It really like, is. Yeah, it it's really, miraculous. Really is. I mean, it really, really is. That's... And I, you know, that's just... So it's... It's All right, really let's break day. before I cry. If you it's want to talk hard... some baseball or you want to do any of that, because I, I feel like we're going to be going at this a long time. And I feel like we, it's a pretty deep dive for, this is my, by the way, if you're listening, it's the first conversation I've had since I got back from Florida. Uh, Luke and I have been covering uh, the NFL owner. Well, Luke's been covering the NFL owners meetings. Eric DaCosta and Steve Bishotti were slithering like cowards running away from me in the middle of the night. I'll be writing about that and talking about it because it happened. And uh, I've also had a great time with baseball. Um, Peter Angelos died over the weekend. You want to mention that or yeah, anything you want to say about that? I mean, I, I did, I saw somebody, I don't forget, I forget whose piece it was, or maybe it was a tweet or whatever, just to, about the double sided of that, of his, of their life. And, you know, like I've, when you and I have talked about that in the past, I, I understand how personally it, their family has impacted you and decisions that have, have impacted you. You know, I'm Did a you hear bit... what I said publicly? Did you hear my piece with Luke? Because I, Luke was like really happy. Like Luke and I have been together, so we did our piece. And and I came back, and Luke, I've known Luke 15 years. And he said to me, "I just want you to know, like, as as a friend, as your partner, employee, whatever I am to you." He's like, "I I thought you really had an appropriate tone about that piece." And I said, "I'm 55 years old. <laughs> I'm not going to jump up and down and do ding dong the witch is dead and like right. I I don't." I'm not really proud of how I handled the Bob Ursay thing. The day he died, I was calling the hospital to make sure he was dead to confirm it. You know what I mean? Like I was, you know, it was 30 years ago. I was a kid, right? right. Um, I I really refrained from anything because he died. I was at a pool in Tampa. My wife texts me and the WNST text came. And then the floodgates open. Everybody's hitting me right. about it on a Saturday afternoon. And I didn't say anything. I said, I got, if you're coming here for me to jump up and down or like, pop champagne like i'll do that when the sale happens um but i'm not doing that over his death i mean he 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 did horrible things to me but um i i i um stuff that i that's so ridiculous that it's so petty that you wouldn't believe it i was staying down in sarasota there was a point where the orioles got our reservations canceled from my company at the hotel the hotel said you can't stay here because the Orioles said so. Like crazy stuff that I, I mean, stuff that like if I had Peter Angelos as a lawyer, I would have sued Peter Angelos. But I, I, I wrote this because like Saturday, people were forgetting that the truth, <laughs> the, the truth of the stadium was built before he bought the team. He didn't save the team. It came with a 30 year lease. People, reporters reported cockamamie. Yeah. You know, the reporters were inaccurately reporting his life achievements. He's done a lot. He did a lot of good things. Say all of that. He didn't yeah. save the team for the city. So yeah. when I wrote to someone and the Baltimore banner wrote in his obituary and this, this slayed me. Angelos never punched down. Well, that stopped me. I'm like, hold on. That's not part of his legacy. I mean, and then also in the same story, there were eight different people that said they declined to comment on his death. Like, right? So I wrote back to the banner folk. I don't know how many people read it. Um, but I said, first thing, he didn't save the team for the city. And he punched down every chance he got once he wasn't punching up. Why do you think no one would give you a quote? They're still afraid of him and he's dead. And that really spoke to me. And I thought, what was his legacy in my life other than people asking me for a quote when he died? And um, I said he terrorized and traumatized a whole lot of people. He was a bully and a coward. 
but aren't all bullies. That's how I'll remember him. And I said, and I knew on the day he died, you and everyone in the media would falsely credit him with saving the team for Baltimore, which is pure bullshit, because it is. He did plenty of good things that are true history. No need to polish a dead billionaire's tarnished legacy. It was tarnished for a reason. There were many needless victims of his acts. Many. And I was one of them. He didn't need to treat me the way he treated me. He enjoyed it. And that's that. You know, so that's where I leave it. But I also leave it with what a week. I mean, opening day, the bridge, city, the worldwide stage, like all of that coming in at a time when Everybody else is beating us up, Bill. But I know when you and I get together, like really privately, and we get together and we talk, we talk about rising Baltimore, right? We we don't talk about there was another victim last night. There was another shooting last night. There was another crime last night. I mean, I had a woman on the plane with me from Parkville for two hours back from Orlando. I caught her taking a dozen shots at Baltimore City in a two-hour plane ride. Even though if you say, where are you from? She'd say Baltimore, right? I, I heard all of the right wing. She, she was coming from visiting her mother in, what's that community where all the Trumpers live in the, 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 the something in the, the, I have to look it up in Florida, the, the, the place old people go when they okay. do golf carts and they. Sounds have, like all of Florida, but tr- yeah. I correct. But there's an area, but she had a dozen cheap shots for the city. That were all the Fox 45, like all of the talking points. I ain't going back down there. I ain't going to the city. Meanwhile, she's crying about the key bridge. I ain't going back to the, like, it's an amazing juxtaposition. And here's the other thing I learned. And this is an interesting thing too about baseball. <laughs> Cause you always say about baseball being in trouble. I'm going to go back to your thing from two weeks ago. We'll get to the bridge and we're, we're doing serious business here. Yeah, I went to Fort Myers because I got to tell you this, because if I don't tell you this, I won't tell you this. Right. And I won't get it on right. the on the radio because I want right. to get this on the radio because it's important because there's an right. incredible observation. You mentioned old white people in Fort Myers and whatever. I went down to Fort Myers for the Orioles Red Sox game on Thursday night. Now, this was the night DeSantis showed up. Right. I have a picture with DeSantis. Right. Did you see that? I don't know. Uh. Ron DeSantis showed up at. Fort Myers at the baseball game, Red Sox, Orioles, end of spring training, meaningless game, beautiful park, little jet blue park right by the Fort Myers airport. And I got there early, walked around, walk, 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 walk. I'm wearing my White Sox, walk, walk, walk. I'm, friends were there. David Richardson was there, said hello to him, pictures, walk, walk, walk. And I started walking around and I looked around and I looked around and I saw Ron DeSantis and I looked around and I walked around and I walked around. And then I started counting people who had skin Darker than mine, which isn't hard, uh, you know, especially I didn't get out in the sun much in Florida. Um, Bill, <laughs> I walked the stadium. I counted nine African-Americans and a couple of them might have been Caribbean, you know, of descent or whatever. Just people with that were not Caucasian, that would not you would not look at them and say that's a Caucasian. There were nine people. <laughs> At, at, at a Red Sox Orioles game with, I don't know, 7,000 people. I literally went everywhere. I walked the whole bowl and I'm like, wow. Because you and I had talked about baseball's problems and stuff like that. This opening day and for the city, I just hope the baseball team can find an outreach mechanism that five years from now, the Camden Yards doesn't look that way, which it usually does. It's not nine, but it's but because we are a city of diversity and stuff like that. I would just hope I, that's my little baseball statement for the growth of baseball, because I don't believe baseball can grow and be sustained in a city like Baltimore downtown unless they can find a way to recruit the real community, not the disgruntled Hispanics and Towson via Dundalk who have cousins in the Hall of Fame that are going to watch the game on TV no matter what. I love baseball. Um, but I'm talking about reaching new people. I hope that for our the baseball side, bridge aside, tragedy, just for opening day, my statement for the new owners and when I write to him is, I hope this is an outreach for everybody. Not just the people Peter made enemies with who love baseball, but that somewhere along the line, there'll be young people who come down and get engaged with baseball and uh, for the good of the city and for the good of the franchise and, and really for the spirit of the community. You know, I mean, like the Orioles, the Ravens, they're the few things we 
the key bridge, as we found out on Tuesday, few things that we that bind us, that bring us together. And I hope that the baseball team can can give us that feeling again, you know, because as I go back, there were many needless victims of Peter Angelos. I'm one of them. And my audience was one of them, too, because of the access of all of it. So that's my baseball thing. You're not going opening day, huh? No, nah. it's going to rain. It's supposed to be like 70 on Sunday. You want to go to the game? No, I won't be. At here. what point are you yeah. going to say yes to me to go to a game? Because I'm going to say yes to you because even when I buy a ticket, Peter Angelos doesn't get the money anymore. So I'm uh, willing to pay yeah. $18 and go uh. down. I might even get a 50 beer because I'm not pissed anymore. You know what I mean? Uh. Like I'm not giving the money to the gypsies. I'm giving it to to to, to the saint who came with $1.8 billion to like – fix this or try to fix it. And part of fixing it is people like me being involved. So I can't tell you to come down and then I don't go. So let's, I'm going to try. <laughs> I got my jersey all them, polished up, you know? Right. Let's find one of them 1230 uh, businessman special days. I all right. Like I, I got an invitation like for you already. We're going to end on this. I have an invitation for you. Ready? Yep. On Tuesday, April 9th, Tuesday, April 9th, I am reconvening the Maryland Crab Cake Tour. Are you familiar with the Maryland Crab Cake Tour, Bill Cole? Maybe. I th- okay. I think well, familiar. let me tell you about the Maryland Crab Cake Tour. It's presented by the Maryland Lottery and good folks like Cole Roofing and uh, and Royal Farms and Wise Markets and all of our great sponsors as well. I'll be giving away 10 times the cash, but here's the deal. The Orioles play the Red Sox at 2 o'clock next Tuesday, the 9th. I think it's opening day for the Red Sox. I think it is. Uh, 2 o'clock game. I'm going to be doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour 11 till 2. So here's the thing. You don't have to buy a ticket. You can't cross the bridge. You're going to have to take the tunnel. One of the tunnels. Find your way over. And I'm going to do 11 to 2 at Costas that day. I might get there a little earlier now because of the bridge, and I, I, I want to do some bridge stuff there that day. And then I'm going to knock it off right around 150, and we're going to, like, pack the equipment up. And at 2 o'clock, we're going to sit and watch the Orioles play the Red Sox on the 9th. What do you think? You can come by. I, there's your afternoon. I gave it. You, you said it. And I it, weather, it's nice inside. It's it's almost like Sky Dome inside of uh, Costas. It can't rain or anything. So what do you think? Come down. I'm gonna I'm gonna do that typical thing where I'm sort of non-committal. Yeah, maybe. I, uh, we'll see. I I'll, give you. I'll I make you feel like I'm interested, mid- but you yeah. know, I got other stuff to do, and I got to clear it up with the yeah. people, the powers that be. You know, you don't love me no more. This is what it is. You don't <laughs> love me no more. Um, Bill Cole is here. He's called Roofing and Gordian Energy. Tell folks what you do for people's roofs, so uh, we can get that plug in for you. We are 100% gear enough for a big spring, summer, trying to clean up. We actually had a winter this year, right? So, you know, a lot of a lot of roofs got messed up and solar's big. Everybody wants solar now. So, uh, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, we look at roofs and figure out how to extend the life, replace them, maybe put solar on them, you know, just try and keep you, keep you dry and then maybe generate some electricity if you want to do that, too. So. Nice. Well, I'll see you next week. I hope to see you on the 9th. Uh, I am Nestor. We are WNST AM 1570 Towson, Baltimore. It's opening day week. Luke and I got a bunch of stuff waiting for you at Baltimore Positive. Uh, I will have some more thoughts on NFL owners meetings and all of that, but we're going to be doing a lot of bridge conversation around here during um, just – just an amazing, amazing week. Uh, and I still haven't seen it yet. So I got to get over to Dundalk and do that. Stay with us. We're Baltimore positive as always.